Good morning, everybody. I'm Karen Tucker, CEO of the Churchill Club, and we're very pleased to be here at Fenwick and West this morning. We thank them for being so generous and hosting and sponsoring the program and many Churchill programs, as you Breakfast Club goers know. Uh, our program this morning is entitled uh, Capturing Today's Profit and Driving Tomorrow's Growth, and of course we have with us Inder Sadu and Jeffrey Moore. Inder and Jeffrey, thank you very much for being here this morning. Before we get started, I would like to make some brief announcements. Our next program is Tuesday, September 28th. It is our annual dinner with Kevin Johnson, CEO of Juniper Networks, and Mary Meeker, famed Wall Street analyst. This is going to be a very interesting pairing um, conversation. Mary Meeker makes and breaks careers and is known for being quite prescient. Uh, relative to spotting trends way ahead of everybody else, and Juniper is doing many innovative things. This is a special, special event, and I hope that you will be able to attend. Um, after that, we have Nick Bilton, lead tech writer for the New York Times Bits and Bits blog, and he's going to be talking about why your world, work, and brain are being creatively disrupted. <laughs> this is a breakfast program. <laughs> <laughs> on October 14, we present Fresh Perspectives in Entrepreneurial Innovation and Economic Growth with Carl Schramm, CEO of the Kauffman Foundation, which is the leading uh, funder of private uh, research related to economic growth and innovation in the U.S. He, in conversation with Steve Blank, a serial entrepreneur known for Epiphany and others, he's now teaching at uh, entrepreneurship at UC Berkeley and Stanford, and Rich Carlgaard, the publisher of Forbes, will come to guide that conversation. And then finally, on October 27, we present uh, James Cameron of Avatar and Titanic fame in conversation with the Google CEO, Eric Schmidt, and this exciting program kicks off our year-long 25th anniversary celebration. Lots of exciting programs next year. Um, just a reminder that we are a member-supported, so in fact, 7,000 individual and corporate members. And if you are not a member, I do encourage you to consider joining us. You will be very glad that you did. And my last announcement, if you are tweeting this morning, please do use pound sign Churchill Club. And now... It's my privilege to introduce our moderator, Jeffrey Moore. Jeffrey is a legend in the industry. Uh, he's made understanding and capitalizing on disruptive technologies the focus of his life's work. He enjoys addressing very big strate strategic challenges, and in fact, um, in his capacity at TCG Advisors, he is one of the leading business consultants in that, uh, in that particular vein. He's also a venture partner at More David Out Ventures, and of course, he's known the world over for his three best-selling books, uh, notably Crossing the Chasm. All of his books are required reading in business schools. Crossing the Chasm is widely known as being one of the most influential business books of all time. And his fourth, fourth book, um, I believe it's your fourth, right, Jeffrey? Fifth, uh, who cares? Fifth, Actually, okay, you stop well, counting after three. <laughs> his fifth book comes out next year. You can watch for that. It's tentatively called Positions of Power. You might have noticed Jeffrey's uh, creative neckwear, his neckwear accessory. He was in a, I guess it was a tennis um, accident, and he's been healing from that. So don't worry, he's healing well. Uh, Jeffrey has no stranger to the Churchill stage. We've, I th think the last time we saw you was 2005, Jeffrey, so it's about time that we welcome you back. Please welcome Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great. It's great. And, and I have to say, by the way, um, the, 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 the people that Karen just read off, those names started with Mary Meeker and uh, uh, um, uh, Kevin Johnson and going through Steve Blank and Rich Carl. I mean, it's, it's, like a, it's like a world-class group of folks. You really, really definitely want to go see those folks. But today's event is what we're here for today. And I get to introduce a friend from 15 years ago at least. Inder and I have known each other forever. He's been at, uh, prior, uh, after being at McKinsey for a while, he went to Cisco, took on marketing roles, took on leading the services group, has become, currently he's the Vice President of Strategy and Planning Worldwide. When Cisco went to a council system, he led the Enterprise Council, he's led the Emerging Countries Council. He's had a ringside seat for the last 15 years to watch John Chambers and the coterie of management and senior management around him turn a company from essentially kind of a hardware provider in the middle of the stack to a major, major force in the world. And he's written a book about it. And what I'd like to, I, I, what we're going to do today is we're going to, I'm asking him to talk a little bit about the book. 
we're going to talk about several of the chapters, and I'm going to engage you guys as early as possible in the question and answer stuff. So after each kind of chapter conversation, I'll be asking questions, but the questions are always better. You have better questions than I do. So, so as soon as you, as soon as you either have an interest or your crap detector goes off, you know, and you say, beep, 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 you know, just pull, pile it on and, and, and it is ready for all. But Inder, let me kick this thing off uh, by asking you, you know, you've written a book, so fellow offer, God bless you. Uh, uh, <laughs> I love the simple <laughs> case, by the way. <laughs> do, do, do the, do the, um, the elevator speech. Like, well, what is, tell us about doing both. So doing both is a very, very, very simple idea. And all it means is looking at every opportunity, looking at every decision as an opportunity to seize as opposed to a sacrifice to endure. It's literally as simple as that. And what happens is a lot of times when we're faced with business dichotomies, we're often making false trade-offs. We pick innovation over operational excellence. We pick discipline over flexibility. We pick customers over partners. We pick sustaining innovation over disruptive innovation, et cetera. And all the time when we're making these trade-offs, there is an opportunity cost of the paths not taken. What doing both says is basically don't force yourself into making that false trade-off. Look for instead the multiplier between two things, the multiplier between A and B. And usually if you try hard enough, what you're going to see is that you can actually get that multiplier and the results is consequently tend to be very, very good. And what's interesting, uh, Jeffrey, is that this is some, th this approach towards picking one thing over the other. It's something that's been pounded into us in business schools that we've attended or managers who we've had who have said, no, 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 prioritize. And there's nothing wrong with prioritization per se. It's just that in the process, we sometimes miss things. You know, when we look at our own ordinary lives, our own day-to-day -day personal lives, we're very comfortable with doing both. Yet when we put on our armor and get to work every morning, we're trying to basically make heart, make some of those decisions. I mean, when you're in your personal life, you, you do doing both very flexibly. Wait a minute, can I like, either be a good husband or be a good father? Do I have to do both? <laughs> you have to do both, <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Whether you like it or not, you absolutely have to do both. Okay, I'm going for it. And when you're being a good father <laughs> yeah. for your kids, yeah. you have to make sure you give them the roots that keep them grounded yeah. and the wings that help them soar. Yeah, you yeah. can't do one or the other. You got to do both. Okay, okay. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, let me, so, so, the power of, and, and one of the phrases for what Indus <clears throat> talked about is the power of and, as opposed to the power of or. And, and I think we, we do get, at least I certainly feel like as a strategist, well, what are you not going to do is a, is a really important question too. So, so let, let's drive into one of these things and see where it goes. So sustaining versus disruptive innovation. Let me tee this up a little bit. Clay Christensen wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, in which he essentially said, Large organizations are optimized for sustaining innovation. Disruptive innovation is so disruptive to the large organization, you really can't get it done. Right. And, and therefore, the, the sensible organization would say, or not and, mm -hmm. and, and, and try to get it done outside. That's not what, that's not what you're advocating. It's not what Cisco does. Right. So talk about, about sustaining yeah. and disruptive innovation. I mean, sustaining and disruptive innovation, obviously, Clayton's done a great job describing it. Uh, as you know, most large companies do sustaining innovation very well. And they do disruptive innovation very poorly. Most startups do disruptive innovation very well, but they do sustaining very poorly. Uh, we believe at Cisco that you actually have to do both. And if you really do both well, you can often get a multiplier effect between the two. Let me give you an example. If you look at Cisco, we used to build, still do, routers, very, very good switches, those kinds of things. Our standard sustaining innovation life cycle of product generates those kinds of products. And thank God for that, because it generates a lot of very good margins. But then what we did is we complemented that with a disruptive innovation engine that helps us drive growth. That's what led us to actually create the voice products that we have. We used some of that technology to enhance our switching products further. We used the enhanced switching products to go back into the storage networking arena through a disruptive innovation approach used the operating system from that to go back to the next generation of switches, took that back to enter into the compute market, took our compute platform to further enhance our networking. So what you see over here is a sustaining innovation life cycle with routers and switches and unified fabric and unified services, et cetera. And you see a disruptive innovation cycle with entry into the voice market, into the storage market, into the compute market. And what you see is going back and forth between those two. You're getting a multiplier effect that is reinforcing each. 
So let me push this up because it's interesting. You have two engines for doing this. And I'm just going to kind of try to put this on the table, and then I want sure. you guys to push back and say, hey, you know, do I believe this or, or, or what's going on? Mm -hmm. So two of those markets, you actually did a spin out, spin in thing. Right, That's right. With Andiamo and with Novus. I think you should right. talk about, about that. Mm -hmm. And then you also have this emerging technology group, which is an organic incubation from within. Right. So let's get both of those sort of capabilities on the table so that we can then have a, a, a dialogue around. The and, and let me, uh, so those are very good examples, Jeffrey. Uh, clearly you've read the book. That's a good sign. <laughs> and uh, those two, to me, are almost like two settings on a dial. So if you're in your kitchen and you're cooking, you know, you've got the cooking range, you've got four, three or four settings on the dial. You've got low heat, you've got medium, you've got medium high, you've got high. And I think the point that I'm trying to make is if you want to cook a good meal, you need all the four settings of the dial. And similarly, when we look at our development or our innovation engine, we need to have all four settings of the dial. At the far left-hand side, if you want to call it that, we have the low risk, the low reward, the low urgency setting of the dial where you have thousands and thousands of engineers who are very happy to make 100,000 bucks a year with a 20% bonus and they've got kids to put in college and all of that and we need a lot of those people because you need to actually sustain the innovation engine and so on. But beyond that, as you start moving to the right hand side, you need other mechanisms of driving this, in, this uh, innovation engine. So spin-ins was one of the things that we decided a few years ago. We look at the industry and we say, here's the roadmap that we want to follow. There's some f gaps in it. Our internal engine is not revving fast enough to fill those gaps. Let's look outside and then we've got a couple of options. We can either buy a company, which as you know, having done 130 of those acquisitions, Cisco does a lot of. But sometimes what happens with that is you're doing that at a point where the valuation is very, very high and you're a little bit late to the market. What you can do with a spin-in is you can go in very early. And what Cisco does is we basically go in and say, look, we're going to partner with you, Mr. or Mrs. Entrepreneur, and we're going to develop a system whereby it clips your upside a little bit but it clips your downside in terms of the risk. We're going to take your creativity, we're going to take your passion, we're going to take your energy, but we're going to combine it with Cisco's management strength, financial strength, resources, sales force, reach, etc., and together we're going to try to succeed in the market. Now what we're not going to do is agree to a valuation up front based upon your delivery of technical deliverables. We're not going to do that. What we are going to agree is that we'll work together, make our products integrated, and then as those products come out, we're going to go out into the marketplace and let the customers vote with their dollars. And if those products are being successful jointly, then we'll have a, we'll have a valuation for you to get spun in that's based on customer and market success. And the other thing we're going to do, Jeffrey, is we're not going to be too hard-nosed about enforcing every term and condition in the contract. We're going to develop a mutual trust so we can look the other way if it turns out that you're struggling on a particular month, but look, but, but succeed together as well. And that approach of basically having a lot of mutual trust, having a set of metrics that are based not on engineering deliverables, but on customer deliverables, and being interlocked gives you, through the spin-in approach, a very good, uh, very good answer. And one of the th those two spin-ins that are most visible, mm -hmm. both are associated in my mind with Mario, right? Yes. Mario Mazzola. Yeah. So there was a personal relationship of trust that kind of went beneath the contractual right. kind of thing. Is, is that fair? It's absolutely true. I think that whenever you're working uh, with entrepreneurs of any sort, the, the element of personal trust is actually very, very key. As a matter of fact, you know, if you look at the spin-ins that we've done, and I think we've done about 22 or 23 over our history, the vast majority of the founders of those spin-ins tend to stay with Cisco for a long time. I'd say I think two, three, four years out, the retention rate is 95% plus. And part of that is because of the personal trust. Now, we use the spin-in to actually enter the voice business, a spin-in to enter the storage business, a spin-in to enter the compute business. And in all three cases, the results have been actually very good for us. But the mutual trust yeah. and relationship is very, very key. I, I don't think anything much happens without that. A statistic I heard from Ron Ritchie once, yeah. I think there's over 100 former CEOs that are employed at Cisco, which is just like a an yeah. unbelievable statistic. Mm -hmm. right? And, and when, you, when we talk about this governance mechanism in a minute, we're, it, I think it will apply. Okay, so that's the spin-in structure. So uh, I'm on my also, stove. Oh, come on, keep, yeah. Keep, yeah. So let's, let's, keep, let's keep talking about the so dials of the stove, stove right? <laughs> so, so actually, that's kind of the medium-high setting of the dial, right? Yeah. So what that says is, you're a startup, you don't want to make 
20 million bucks personally, you want to make 2 million bucks personally, so we'll do the spin in structure and you can come that way. But there's actually a setting of the dial that somewhere in between being a development engineer at Cisco versus being an engineer who works inside a spin in. You, you don't want to make 100,000, but you don't want to take the risk associated with making 2 million. I'm, I'm making up these numbers, by the way, these, but, but they're probably not. I'm, I'm writing them down. Don't okay, but they're not too far. And we're being right? recorded. Don't worry. <laughs> right? <laughs> Somewhere in between those two, there is another setting of the dial where somebody says, look, I got a lot of energy. I got a lot of passion, but I want to go build something great. But I really like working at Cisco because I like the culture. I love John Chambers. It feels like family. I don't want to leave but I want to be in an entrepreneurial environment. And that's where we do internal venturing or incubation. We set up a business unit called the Emerging Technologies Group. It's led by a guy by the name of Martin De Beer, someone who's a company loyalist, but has, you know, he has the heart of a company loyalist, but he has the soul of an independent entrepreneur. And what he did is he created this business unit that generated the telepresence products that Cisco is very well known for. But what we did to those engineers, and I'm going to be off a little bit on the numbers, but we told them, we're going to incubate you. Your funding is not going to be touched by the rest of the corporate antibodies who are going to squeeze you out. You're going to report directly to the CEO. We're going to put you in a separate building. We're going to ask you to conceptualize products in a whole new way. And oh, by the way, if you do it in 18 months, that's terrific. If you do it in 15 months, we'll give you a $25,000 check. And if you do it in 12, it's $50,000. If you do it in 9, it's $100,000. And all of a sudden, you show up in the middle of the night on a Saturday, and, there's a, and the parking lot is full of cars. Why? Because people are excited, they're energized, not just by the monetary element, but by the opportunity to create something new. So that's kind of, you know, development engineering is the first setting of the dial. Internal incubation is the setting, second setting of the dial where you get the additional rewards. Spin-ins is the third setting of the dial where you're going outside Cisco. We may never buy you, but still you're taking some risk. And finally, the last setting of the dial, God bless you, is go to your own startup. And if it turns out that we've missed the market or we've missed the window, chances are, at some point, we'll acquire you anyway, right? <laughs> so you get all four settings on the dial. And I think the, the, the point of this is you got the spectrum. You got low risk, low reward, low urgency on one side. And you got high risk, high reward, high urgency on the other side. And it's not that any one of the settings of the dial is valued any more or any less than the other. They're all equally valuable. I don't want people, you know, I don't want 20,000 engineers who are sitting at Cisco, probably some of them will watch this thing, ever thinking that they're valued any less than the guy who goes out there and starts a company. We value everybody. It's just the making sure that we have all the settings so we can do and value disruptive innovation and sustaining innovation. And the, the, the nice thing about that, Jeffrey, is when the two work together, great things happen. You know, when we had to do telepresence, as an example, they had to go away. Martin and team had to go away in ETG and create that. They used cardboard boxes and foam uh, blocks to actually reconceptualize a whole new product category. But then they used Cisco's call manager, which was installed in virtually every Fortune 500 company, to get speed to market. Right. So that helped. And then what Telepresence did for the rest of the Cisco routing and switching portfolio is it created the demand. So you get that multiplier effect, which results in dramatically good things happening. So that's our. Yeah. Kind of our sustaining innovation engine that throws out 65% gross margins out there and is very profitable. And you got a disruptive innovation engine that creates new businesses and delivers the growth. And when you combine the two, you get a consistent set of returns. So, so okay, so, so, so that's a pretty cool formula. Why, why doesn't every company in the Valley do it? Where, if you had to push back at that, if you were on the board of directors of your, if Inter became CEO of the next company, said, well, this is what we should do, would you say, great, let's go do it? Would you say, no, you know what, in our experience, this doesn't work, or I have challenges with this? Where are you guys with this? I mean, somebody, somebody should, somebody's pushback button ought to be blinking red about now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Does it make a distinction as to whether you're talking about platform innovation versus product innovation? And why? And why? Why do you say that? Because it's unlikely you're going to let platform innovation for your core product be spun out so you can spin it back in. Mm -hmm. Whereas, say, okay, we're, we're, so, so the, the point I made was there's a difference between platform innovation mm -hmm. and product innovation or services innovation. It seems to me that you could, while you might purchase a platform, say, for IP telephony, right. once you've purchased that platform, it's now internal, whereas 
adding a feature to it might well be done externally. Right. Yeah, and, and, and what I would say, uh, to, so the question was about platform innovation versus product innovation, and which one would you do internally versus externally, et cetera. The one thing, actually, even before I get to the second part of that question, I'd say you have to do both product and platform innovation. You can't just do one or the other, because product innovation without turning it into a platform will eventually end up uh, in commoditized margins, and so you have to do both. But uh, as far as platform innovation is concerned, yeah, you do want a lot of that happening internally, but you don't want to restrict yourself. Innovation happens anywhere and everywhere, so even if it's a platform innovation, you could bring it in from the outside, but once you bring it in, then you need to develop all the community-oriented skills uh, and uh, platform-oriented skills are required for let, that. Let me, let me push, uh, let me mm -hmm. try to push that a little bit further. So once I've committed to a platform, I'm in sustaining mode, mm -hmm. aren't I going to be in resistance to any disruption to my own platform? And how do you prevent that? Or how do you, not to prevent it, but how do you, how do you embrace that? Yeah, th there's always going to be, in fact, whether it's a platform or not, there's always going to be inside any company the antibodies that come out and that basically say, no, 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 this disruptive stuff is bad. It's going to make us lose our margins. As a matter of fact, the reason disruptive innovation, Jeffrey, is so hard to do is because your investors really, when it comes time to vote for their dollars, don't want you to do it. Believe it or not, that was Grayson's thing. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they don't want you to do it. Your customers don't want you to do it because they're saying, I bought all those routers and switches. I just want the next generation of those. Just keep innovating. I don't want it to get disruptive. Your employees sometimes don't want to do it. So you have to really try to do it, and, and, and that's hard. So you have to avoid all the antibodies. And I think, that to me, the key of this is you need three things working in tandem in order to make this succeed. You, it's almost like saying you need all three legs of the stool. And what are the three legs of the stool? First, you need to have the culture that supports it. If you don't have the culture, that explicitly supports it, like John Chambers reaching out to Martin De Beer, who was running a 1,500-person organization, pulling him out of there and saying, here you are with another person in a two-person shop, go create this, and I will support you and I will protect you, etc. You need the culture. Certainly, you need the process whereby you're actually figuring out what's your life cycle for actually doing disruptive innovation. And thirdly, you need the technology whereby you can get all the collaboration, etc. going. I mean, the process of disruptive uh, Jeffrey was very interesting at Cisco because what did we do? We actually said, we need the best ideas. Let's open it up. We set up a competition. I prize was the thing. Quarter million dollar prize, open to anyone. People from 104 countries submitted 1,100 ideas. And we evaluated them. Based on that analysis, we picked the winning idea. Then what we did is we took a couple of teams of very senior directors in the middle of the company, and we said, Here's the idea, create a business plan around it. Of course, we offered the person who came up with the idea a job to work at Cisco and told them we'll start a business unit. And those two teams of seven or eight directors almost acted like the management team of a startup. And a month and a half later, they came back and presented to a bunch of us who acted like the venture capitalists. And the two teams were competing because they were doing the same thing. So you got a process there of getting the ideas, evaluating the ideas. We created a business unit out of it. And then what we said is, we're going to give that business unit its own sales force, much like a startup would, not the mainstream Cisco engine. And once you give it that sales force, it takes the product from that critical gap of 10 million to 100 million. You know, Cisco is one of those companies where if you get a product to $100 million, we got a sales force that can take it to a billion and beyond easily. We do it day in and day out. We're We've got a culture that encourages a lot of startups inside the company that get to 10 million. The critical gap is in the middle. How do you take something from 10 to 100? That's where this process of having the startup type of a culture created inside the company. And then what we do, by the way, is we avoid one of the problems that a lot of startups have, which is any customer who sh shakes money at them, they want to go pursue. We were very disciplined. Thank, uh, thanks to you, uh, Jeffrey. Who we, have a, we have the expression we call crossing the chasm inside the belly of a whale. That's and that right. was the 10 to $100 million journey about that we're doing it. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and we had to do that because w as soon as you have the innovative product, a lot of customers say, I'll take one, I'll take one, I'll take one. And very soon, the small startup development team gets completely dispersed. And, and not dispersed, they, they get uh, distracted. And so what you want to do is you say, I'm going to take only one application, 
at one customer and make it really robust. And once I do that, then I'm going to go to the next and then the next, the bowling pin kind of approach. And we very carefully did that in every one of our successful incubated business units. And then for those ones that didn't work, we actually eliminated those businesses. So it's a very good process, coupled with the culture, coming all the way from the CEO, and the technology of collaboration that Cisco creates itself. You put those three things, you start to get a little bit of a winning formula whereby you can actually have disruptive innovation happen very nicely in, uh, in, inside a large company. I mean, I'll give you a couple of numbers. From 2007 to 2009, this emerging technologies business unit had its, the total revenue of its product grew ninefold, 900%. We started nine different business units. Three of those have already crossed the $100 million mark. So something's working here. Now, I will also say that not every one of them worked. We were actually very excited about a business unit called IPEX, right? Great technology and so on, but somehow didn't work, didn't have the right people, the culture wasn't working, the process didn't get exercised, or sometimes the market opportunity wasn't there. But uh, quite, quite, uh, quite an interesting process. And I'll just add one footnote on technology, because I was on one of the iPrize committees at one point. The whole thing was done by telepresence. So you watched an entrepreneurial team, even the team was, was diverse. We had, a t we had a team member in London and a team member in Sao Paulo pitching a deal in San Jose all over telepresence. So that's, that's the right. technology piece. Yeah, no, it absolutely okay. well, So I, I, very cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on just in the interest of kind of, you have eight sure. different chapters in this book and you're looking at eight different both and ands. I'm going to get a couple more on the table okay. and then and, and, and push it up. So another one that we, that we spend a lot of time in our practice struggling with is you're either going to be a complex systems company or a volume operations company mm -hmm. because the, uh, uh, the, the margins are different, the processes are different, the people's different, marketing's different, sales is different, engineering is different, even the person drilling in the background is different. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so you guys, again, you're saying, no, 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 Jeff, do both. So talk a little bit about your experience with, <laughs> with the, those two different business models. Yeah, the, the fundamental idea that I'm trying to portray this Jeff, is that this power of doing both, the power of the end, doing both and looking for a multiplier, that's something that also applies not just to sustaining and disruptive innovation as we just discussed, it also applies to existing and new business models. So if you look at Cisco, what's our existing business model? We basically try to build high value networking products. We sell them through a high touch channel coupled with a lot of value add partners. Uh, largely to enterprise or enterprise-like customers. It's a complex systems business. It generates 65% type of gross margins and 30% operating margin before tax and about 23% net margins after tax for us. And it has for the last 25 years. So that's our existing business model. Not a bad one to have and it's actually the envy of the industry, right? That's the existing business model. Now you could stay with that business model and never again venture into a new business model. And that would actually slow you down. It would stymie you. You want to actually go into new areas. I mean, I remember a story when uh, it was interesting, uh, John Chambers, our CEO, um, you know, one day he saw his son uh, wiring up their house uh, in Los Altos uh, Hills. Uh, and John said, clearly, you must be using Cisco products. <laughs> and his son said, no, that I'm not, actually. It's like, why, why is that? Well, because they're not cheap enough. Now, you know if John Chambers' son has a problem buying networking products, we got a bad economy, right? But seriously, so, 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 so he said, well, they're not cheap enough. I can't buy them at Fry's, and they're not relevant to what I'm trying to do, which is something simple, network home connections. So John makes a note of it, and he says, hmm, whose products are you using? Well, John, it's Lynx, it's a little company, I go over to Fry's and I buy the product. So John makes a note of it, figures out that we've been trying to get into this consumer business. We made three attempts. We've hired three VPs of consumer. We fired all three of them because somehow it's not working. But the real problem is that the company's DNA was not supportive of it. So what we did is we finally decided to buy Linksys. It's interesting. Linksys is a company when we bought it a few years ago, the average selling price of a Linksys product was $50. They were selling 10 million units a year roughly. And they, it they, wasn't 63% gross margin. It was not 63% <laughs> gross margin, it was 28% gross margin. But, but it's very exciting, I mean it was a $450 million company selling, tell me, oh, cool. and right, it was a volume operations and we had to figure out that you got to set the process in place in order to actually uh, acquire this kind of a capability if you don't have it internally. And then what we have to do is keep it separate. 
I mean, the corporate guys will smother you with their love so much they're going to kill you from, by choking you to death through the bear hug. And we had to keep them separate for a while. I'm and here from corporate, and I'm here to help. And I'm right, here to right, help, right? right and right, so we had right, to right. we had to keep them separate down there in the LA area, and 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 not not. Now, what's very interesting, though, Jeff, on you know while we're on this topic of new business model, if I can tell you another um, incident is, we bought Linksys, which did very well. The revenue doubled. All that good stuff happened. But then a few years later, the big video revolution is starting to happen, right? Uh, all the stuff going on YouTube and so on. So we decided, okay, we want to be in the video business because all these millions of routers are connected to a service provider and the service providers want to dish out video. Do we have the capability? We thought we did, but we really didn't. So then we had to go buy another company, interestingly, and that's again, we tried doing it ourselves. We got some success, but we realized it was a custom business model. So while the Linksys model was pulling us in one direction, saying $50 products at 38% gross margin, we decided that with major service providers, we had to go and build customized products for them. We had to establish a business unit, an entire engineering business unit, for one customer. We acquired this company, Scientific Atlanta, that had video knowledge. Just an interesting factor, Jeffrey. Linksys, when we acquired it, 10 million customers, entire company was 450 million in revenue. When we acquired Scientific Atlanta, its single largest customer was $450 million, one customer. Custom engineered products. Not only that, custom engineered relationships. I mean, our team was very proud that they actually knew the name of the spouse of the buyer. Till the guy from Scientific Atlanta said, did you realize that his brother's granddaughter has diabetes? <laughs> and have you contributed to that? And we realized, OK, this is customer. But interestingly enough, did that level of- You actually have to intermarry in this business <laughs> model. That, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what's interesting about that is, uh, you know, that customer intimacy that they had was also forcing them to largely be an 80, 90, 95% US company with only a handful of customers. So here comes Cisco with its reach all around the globe, takes the customer intimacy from them, and marries it. So now you can see this beautiful model that we have in the center, 65% gross margin and 30% operating margin, getting stretched to one side in terms of volume operations, 28% gross margin and $50 products, and then getting stretched all the way to the other end where you had a $450 million. I mean, 80% of Scientific Atlanta's business was five customers, and they were a $2 billion company. Right? So it gives you a sense of how you get, you're getting stretched on both sides, but it gives you the lift during bad well, times. So, so if G, mm -hmm. I could imagine GE saying that, but the way GE would do it would say, Scientific Atlanta, you're your own company. Yep. Cisco, you're your own company. Linksys, you're your own company. We have a holding company called General Electric. Right. We have a management, we have a set of operating returns on capital stuff here. Mm -hmm. uh, but you guys don't actually inter, interact with each other, so there wouldn't be any multiplier effect in if Jeffrey Immelt was That's running right. this show. That's so right. so talk, uh, so is that how you did it with SA and Linksys, or, or, or what happened? No, what, what we did is we kept them apart for a certain amount of time, so we don't actually lose the edge that they had, because that edge, that separate different business model was the first, was the reason why we bought them in the first place. So when you buy somebody because they're different, don't try to make them just like you. Because then, <laughs> then all you've done is overpaid for something, right? So what we did is we said, look, at Cisco we have a single P&L. There's only one profit and loss. What, what we don't do is we don't divisionalize our company, much like some other valley companies over here do, large ones. And what we do is we basically say we're going to keep a single P&L, and that's going to cause everybody to act in the same consistent manner. And what that does, Jeffrey, it, it delivers for us these pillars of functional excellence. You got a sales force that has very high productivity. You've got a uh, services engine that has very low cost and at the same time very high value add customer and, and very high customer sack numbers, et cetera. You got a manufacturing engine that's very highly rated, et cetera. So you get that functional efficiency, but at the same time you're able to access new markets. So now I'm getting lost because okay. I would have argued that the sales efficiency for a volume operations company and the sales efficiency for a complex systems company, I think are two different kinds of efficiency and I don't see a lot of synergy between them. Agreed. So what, when, when I say we have a functionally organized company, we organize all the functions together. But what we do is, for example, Linksys is largely a retail oriented thing. Right. So when we're selling to retail, that's a separate thing. When we're selling to major service providers, by the way, because major service providers are also buying Linksys routers by 
the millions, Comcast bought millions of them, right? They were using our mainstream engine to actually get that efficiency. Got it, got it. So, okay. so again, so, so complex systems volume operations, this has been the downfall of many a company, right? When, when Compaq and DEC merged, the CFO said, you know, we're going to get the value of DEC and the margin of the efficiency of Compaq, and unfortunately, they got the other way around. <laughs> and and, and it, was, it was disastrous. And Charles Schwab bought U.S. Trust, and it, 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 there's lots of things. So again, pushback from the group, or, 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 or um, I mean, why, I guess my issue is just, what do you think, in, in terms of either culture, process, or technology, allows Cisco to get away with this because it really has been the downfall. IBM had to get out of the PC business. They just right. couldn't do volume ops. Right. Um, why, what, 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 is there, yes, please, go ahead. Well, how, how the, 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 oh, yeah, there's a mic coming there. With a single P&L and different business models, how do you continue to fund back into those businesses as they develop? Do, does, do the margins not just go to that big P&L, or do they get put back into those small businesses? OK, so, so, so that's a good question. The, the way we do that is there is a cultural element that basically says, we're going to fund whatever is best for the customer. The, the fundamental strategy of Cisco is about two things. It's about customers. And it's about market transitions. We want to capture the market transitions. We want to satisfy. Those two things are the lens. They, they, they are the compass that guides us in all these things. One of the ways in which we did that, and this actually speaks to governance and structure, is we have at Cisco a, like most other companies, we have a pyramid, a organizational pyramid. Right? You got the CEO at the top. You got sales, engineering, marketing, et cetera, reporting to the CEO. And underneath sales, you got the geographies. And underneath engineering, you got the technology units. And underneath market, you got the market segments, et cetera. Right? So that's a classic pyramid. And if you were to go to the Cisco internal website, you could type anybody's name. And you could see everybody in their upward and downward reporting chain, et cetera. So that's the classic functional pyramid, which we use for authoritative decision making, for efficiency, for functionally driven metrics. But what we did in order to address exactly the question or the issue that you're raising is we actually created a parallel pyramid next to it. And that parallel pyramid is our collaborative business model. What that is is basically, instead of the CEO at the top, it actually has the operating committee, which is John and about 10 or 12 people at the top. And then underneath it, it has these councils. And what a council is is basically any business that we think we can turn into a $10 billion business. For example, our enterprise business has a council. Our service provider business is a council, and so on and so forth. Our emerging countries business is a council. And we have those councils. Underneath those councils, we have boards for $1 billion opportunities and so on. And they bring together, in pursuit of the customer, all the cross-functional people. Now, all these people are working for the same P&L, so they're not trying to defend internally among themselves uh, what their own functional or department or divisional P&Ls are. I mean, it's a little. Bit, it's very, very different from matrix management. Uh, you know, in, in order to assign. Well, the, this, is, this actually is a, a transition to this third governance structure because it, it really is unique mm -hmm. to Cisco, as far as I can, as far as I can tell. So, what Indra just said: very strong functional culture, and the allocation of budget is through the functional process, not the. But the jawboning and the lobbying for allocating the budget happens in the council process. Mm -hmm. So what? Well, this first, this council process, you've been involved with it for how many years? How many, Ever since it started about eight or nine years ago. About eight or nine years ago. Um, it didn't start with a bang. No, it did not. It was quite unsuccessful in the beginning. So, t so give us a little bit of the history of, of how, you know, because it feels like, I mean, sometimes in Cisco you hear council 1.0, council 2.0, council 3.0. Right. So talk a little bit about the evolution of this well, thing and this collaborative model. Yeah, the way it started is, I mean, initially you got very strong people who are running very strong functions. And John said, well, let's have these councils so we can work. The councils can be the guardians of the customer's interest. And they can actually work cross-functionally. Initially, people didn't believe in it. The first uh, head of the enterprise business council actually sat in the back of the room and did his email during council meetings. That was not a very successful model. Uh, gradually, we said, OK, well, let's give a little bit more weightage to the councils. And the councils evolved to becoming obstacle removers. So very quickly, they started removing, OK, here's a business, there's an obstacle. We're not, uh, for example, in the emerging countries council where we don't have um, legal entities in different countries. Emerging countries council goes off, removes that obstacle, et cetera, et cetera, right? 
So once we started removing the obstacles, then we sort of started to get better and better people on the councils. Once that started to happen, we said, all right, councils, your job now is to define the strategy and the job of the functions is to execute the strategy. Once that started to happen, you get even better people on the council. Ne this current rev of the council, what we're saying is that all the business metrics for the business belong to the council. They're responsible for revenue. They're responsible for customer satisfaction. They're responsible for profitability and so on. Even though the council leader doesn't necessarily have the budget for that. The budget still sits within the functions. So you're giving them that responsibility. And also, the leaders of the councils, interestingly enough, are all the same people who are the leaders of the functions. So there's a very tight linkage with empowered people. So if, if I'm the head of engineering or if I'm the head of sales, I'm going to make sure that the council that I'm on is being successful. And that was actually very critical, getting the right people in these roles. One last thing, thing about it. So that culture process. I want to put technology in here mm -hmm. because I have to say that, that I think this, you should talk a little bit about telepresence and its impact on this idea of, of collaborative governance. Mm -hmm. Because collaborative governance is, it has become matrix management and the death of action right. in many, many, many large corporations. Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, it, it's actually, when, when we started on this model, a lot of people said, Cisco's lost its mind. John Chambers has gone nuts. He's actually turning this place into a socialist enterprise run by committees with millions of people sitting in meetings all day long. And I can actually tell you that that turned out, turns out is absolutely false. It's not the case. You know, I'll give you an example. So what happens in a matrix management? Let's say I'm working at a matrix management company. And there is a meeting uh, to do something big. And the big thing is our company is going to go into cloud computing, but it requires all these four divisions to collaborate. Well, first thing that happens is that the general manager of the division sends to the meeting not himself, but one of his uh, staff people three levels down. That person shows up at the staff meeting. Their job is to somehow make sure that they survive the 60 minutes of the meeting without giving away any of their budget to this corporate cause. And if they come back while preserving their budget, their manager says, good job. At least now we can go back to our functions because that's what I'm being measured on. So what that results in is the least common denominator. That's why matrix management fails. Because you have an unempowered person trying to act parochially uh, in a structure where the incentives are all divisionalized. For us, instead of the least common denominator, we get the highest possible aspiration. And the reason for that is because we require on the councils to have the senior most people. I mean, I was sitting in a meeting where John Chim you know, this was an operating committee meeting, and somebody was being pro proposed to be promoted to senior vice president. And John said, and I remember this clearly because many other people remember it as well, John said, do not bring in front of me any person for promotion to senior vice president who has not played a significant role on a Cisco council or a board. All of a sudden, people realize it's not enough to succeed on your job. So you're getting the best people. They are sitting on the table. I've run two councils, and I can tell you if there was somebody at the table and we had them, we had to make a decision, and they said, I got to go check with my boss. We told them, next time, please have your boss sitting here rather than you, because if you can't make the decision at the table, we'll find somebody who can. And because we are not driven by individual siloed PLs, it's just one corporate PL, everybody is actually willing to put forth the actual uh, investment and the resources. Interest, it's very counterintuitive, because normally you think committees slow things down. What we've actually found is that very, very quickly, you know, we can take an idea and put it in front of our board of directors in 45 days. I mean, I'll give you the example of Smart Grid, right? Smart Grid originated in Europe for Cisco as a area that we should build technology. And it's something, it's clearly a network technology, and we needed to have some air focus in that area. Uh, Chris Tedicote, one of our leaders in uh, Europe, uh, said, I think this is important. We said, all right, why don't you get an engineering counterpart, form a board around it? They formed a board around it. The board got a few other people. And within 45 days, we were in front of our board of directors saying, here's the investment required. Here's the business we're going after. Now, one very interesting byproduct of this is that in most functional organizations, you have people on all levels of the organization who are fundamentally very capable people, but who have no outlet for their creativity, their passion, and so on, because they're stuck behind some 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 buffoon who's their boss, right? And so they can't actually it's usually synonymous. So, boss and yeah, yeah. Yeah. right. That's why they start with the same letter, yeah, yeah B, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 so yeah, so yeah. and, and the right? And we actually said, okay, we need to do this in smart grid. 
it unleashes so much talent on these councils and boards. And we have at Cisco nine councils and 47 boards. We have about 300 people participate in that. So much talent frees up. And you find it in unexpected places for smart grid. We found that the person who was running government affairs for us right. wow. turns out to be the person who we finally decided to make the general manager of that business unit because she had the passion for it. So why, do, why aren't you the world's largest travel budget in the world to make this council system work? I mean, think about <laughs> how many council and board meetings it takes to mm -hmm. get through this. Why can you do this in 45 days? Um, this is a, by the way, a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> but, but part of the reason for that, and, and normally it would be the case uh, uh, if, if, if we were uh, you know, one of the other companies, etc. Uh, but because we have things like telepresence, and telepresence has pluses and minuses, by the way, but, but the big plus of it is that because we've got technologies like telepresence, people can collaborate all over the world. I mean, Cisco, three years ago, before the downturn, we used to have a travel budget of $750 million per year. That's not a small amount of money. $750 million of travel budget a year. That's how much was being spent. After telepresence was introduced, we actually, within a year, were able to bring that down to $240 million. A $510 million decline paid for the 1,000 plus telepresence rooms we have in six months. But the real beauty of it was not that you were saving cost on travel, by the way, that 240 million is not a sustainable number. We're back up to about 350 because that's more sustainable now that things are picking up. So just full disclosure. Uh, but still, it's half. Right? Still, it's half of what. Oh, and the time. And the fact and, that you and have the to go to bed in your own bed at night. And, 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 and the best thing, I mean, I remember you know, we were in Hawaii. Uh, uh, my wife and I were having dinner with John. And, and he said, I'm sleeping a lot better. And I said, John, what do you mean? And he said, I'm out so often with so many customers in every part of the world, I don't know which time zone I exist in. But ever since telepresence, I come home, I get a good night's sleep, I'm refreshed, I'm doing three, four, five times as many customer visits, and I'm always in the same time zone in terms of body clock. But that, that, that's one of the big advantages. But the biggest thing to me is it enables meetings to happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Okay. I'll just give you an example. Uh, you know, Sarah, Sarah and I were yesterday, actually, um, uh, uh, day before yesterday, uh, we were having a meeting with 14 different journalists from eight different countries in Central and, Europe, uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So our team had put them together. They wanted to talk about this book, doing both, and so on. And there were 14 journalists, everyone from Ukraine to Hungary to Budapest to Prague, to et cetera, et cetera, eight different countries. And I did a one and a half hour meeting with them. They loved it. And, and I told them right off the bat, I said, look, if it wasn't for telepresence, with all due respect to you, I would not have flown over to Europe to have this meeting with you. And frankly, you wouldn't have flown over here to have that meeting with me. So the meeting wouldn't have happened. I mean, Paul Mountford, one of our, uh, uh, the leader of our emerging countries business, wanted to meet with the third most important person in Russia because there was a massive deal that had to be done. So Paul asks his team to set up the meeting, and they come back and they say, Paul, we contacted the folks in Moscow, and they say we can have the meeting in four and a half months. Or if you're willing to do it on telepresence, we can have it on Thursday. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the light goes off, and he said, wait a second. This is not about travel budget saving. This is about making meetings happen that couldn't have happened otherwise. This is about accelerating a massive deal and bringing it in by four months. It's actually uh, an amazing benefit. So that's, that's why these councils right. and, uh, and, and boards work. The one disadvantage I would say is that you often end up working a little bit too hard. And that's because when you're so connected, the you know people don't hesitate to have a meeting at 7 p.m. over here because it, because it's 7:30 in India and they say hey look uh, we'll all be equally inconvenienced right <laughs> and so it so, so it does have a little bit of a negative impact on the lifestyle but uh, but, but it is a great technology it certainly beats flying so so just I'm, I'm, I'm going to open this up and I'm, I'm going to ask you guys to actually drive the last 15 minutes of this thing let me just kind of recap what you've heard so the thesis here is you know. Management wisdom is all about, the conventional management wisdom says you've got to make the tough choices, either this or that, step up, don't waffle, don't weasel, make a commitment. And what Inder is saying is no, step up, don't waffle, don't weasel, and do both. And he's given us three examples from, a, he's got eight chapters, so there's five other uh, areas he's working in the book. But he said, look, Clayton Christensen, yeah, I read the, the, the Innovator's Dilemma, no. You disrupt, embrace disruptive and sustaining in the same company, get the cross-function. 
you know, he's probably read the, uh, dealing with Darwin, which says you can't do complex systems and volume ops in the same company. He says, thank you, Jeffrey. No, we do both in the same company and get the crosstalk like the reselling of a million Linksys routers through the, through the Comshare guys. And then he said, you know, have decisive line-oriented execution and have collaborative decision making. Pick one. No, do both. Okay, so so. Don't you have some questions? <laughs> okay, uh, three hands, four hands popped up here. Okay, all right, we've, we've definitely got it going. Go ahead. Hi, um, Susan Dawson, and I have a couple of questions. Um, Maybe just one, Susan, to make sure we can get, we can just pick one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think your structure, I think your, <laughs> thank you. I'm the, I, that's him, I'm the moderator. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. What happened to recognition and compensation in your collaborative culture? Great question. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So for those of you who didn't hear, what happened to recognition? I'm ask you to do short answers. because okay. okay, go ahead. All right. Um, so uh, in the collaborative culture, uh, recognition actually uh, increased and improved. One of the things we actually say is you need to have both superstars and teams in order to succeed. And uh, one of the initial uh, knocks against our collaborative model was, gosh, doesn't this uh, stifle creativity because everything's by committee? Actually, it turns out, no, it doesn't. You have great people coming up from the bottom. And we had a guy called Stuart Hamilton who actually was a sports nut, got very excited about sports, thought Cisco could go enter into the sports business, and uh, used his credit card, stole some equipment from the lab, put together a solution, cobbled it together, sold it uh, uh, 30 units to the Arizona Cardinals, and all of a sudden, Started to get some traction. So what happened then, to the comp pro wait, 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 wait. I'm going to push yeah. back. I'm going to say Susan's question. What happened to the comp program? The comp programs were modified so that people who are playing a significant role on councils and boards were actually rewarded for that. Bingo. Right. Okay. So what we did, for example, for our development council, which is run by five senior people, is we said that 30% of your compensation is going to be dependent on your performance as individuals and 70% on your performance as a group. Okay, that's a good one. Next question. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on the impact of size of your company on something like this. Uh, this all sounds great for a four $40 billion company. I'm wondering how you know, a $1 billion company is going to make this kind of thing work. Yeah, I, I think uh, it can work in a $1 billion company as well. I think it works in companies of most sizes. Uh, it's actually sometimes easier to make it work in a $1 billion company than a $40 billion company because you're going to be naturally functionally organized. Uh, and because culture is going to be stronger and more high touch, you're actually, if you actually have the mindset to do it, you can actually get it done even more powerfully, even more convincingly in a smaller company. How big was Cisco when you joined it 15 years ago? Uh, I think it was about a billion dollars. So, okay, so the, the size that we're talking about. Do right. you think that, did this, what you're talking about, was that built into Cisco 15 years ago, or is this something that has come to prominence in more recent years? I think more recent years. I, I, I think uh, the, the council and board piece has come into prominence more really, recently, really. but the doing both idea has been there in Cisco right from the beginning. I think that, that, you know, I've been in hundreds of meetings where, you know, someone will come and say, John, I can give you profitability in this business, but not growth, or growth, but not profitability, or I have a lot of innovation, but no operational excellence, and vice versa. And every time he says, go back, give me both. And I tell you what, nine times out of 10, people come back and they've actually figured out what the multiplier is, and they give him both. And I think it, it, he's it very, but he, he is absolutely uncompromising about it. Uncompromising that. about it, and, and, and you see the results. Next question. Yes, oh, good. Um, my name is Axel Fuchs. I have two more questions, or one question related to the innovation. So I think the two problems are really that either your customers are not asking for it yet, so there may be a smaller market that you're not addressing, or too small for you. And the second problem might be that you cannibalize your existing business. So what are these uh, hurdles? I mean, how, how do you overcome those what, hurdles? This is classic Clay Christensen problem. Right. Either the market's too small or you're going to cannibalize my existing 63 point whatever margin right, business. Right, right, you right. can't do this, right? <laughs> okay, what, what's the answer? So I think for um, markets being too small, I think because we're so open to the notion of innovation coming from anywhere, uh, you know, I mean, there, 
if you if if you've got 125 or 135 whatever number of companies that you've acquired over the years it means you're not relying on an internal innovation model as well so yes you'll always want to have a mindset that says let's not ignore small opportunities but you always want to be open and acquire small startups that are actually going after that market the interesting thing i found and jeffrey you mentioned this as you know crossing the chasm and the belly of the whale interestingly enough we don't have any issue at least as far as i can tell with uh, having enough flowers bloom, you know, the zero to $10 million ideas, we've got plenty of those. Sometimes we have a problem killing off some of those, we got that many of those. So that tends never to be an issue. And, uh, and then I think the, the second question, which is how do you avoid the um, cannibalization. Uh, cannibalization of your existing product lines? Uh, you just have to have a focused mindset around it. I think uh, there's always going to be some people, I'm going to be very uh, transparent here, who are going to always say, look, we've got to protect our business, we've got to protect our business. But sometimes you have to cannibalize your own. I mean, I remember when we had, uh, uh, still do, multiple switching product lines. And what was interesting was the, we have different business units, the low-end switching, medium, high-end switching. And the boundary between low and medium, or between high and medium switching, was not a clean boundary, it was a little bit overlapping. And we had so much dysfunction because the high-end guy and the medium-end guy would fight with each other because, you know, the high-end guy wanted to capture. And we said, it's okay. It feels a little bit dysfunctional. You'll fight it out. But at the end of the day, you're going to be so butted up against each other that nobody's going to be able to get in. And, and, and so what happens is you've got to keep cannibalizing yourself on an ongoing basis. Okay. And, and that's the mindset. If I might add oh, yeah. a little bit, I think if you don't cannibalize yourself, Somebody outside is going to come in and disrupt you. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I think former is a better option because. Right. Uh, Absolutely. Great, great, great comment. Yeah. If you don't eat your lunch, somebody else will. That one. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I'm David Burton from SAP, and my question is regarding timing. Mm -hmm. To apply the right option in the dial, mm -hmm. and to find the right timing to do that. Naturally, we all know great examples of. Uh, acquisitions that came too late, mm -hmm. um, innovations that came too late. Which of those options do you find most uh, tricky in finding the sort of right timing to apply? I think you see your switches on your on your stove. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the switches on the stove or the, or the settings of the dial. Wh what we find is if you are at a situation where you've not been focused or smart enough to actually capture something at the right time, acquisition is almost a means of last resort because you missed it and somebody else got it. So you want to go over there. If you want to have a situation where very tight integration between the Cisco product and the startup's product is required, that's when you do more of a spin-in. If you have a situation where there's a great deal of secrecy and it is very core and fundamental, like the question here about the internal platform that needs to be owned, then you do more internal incubation uh, or uh, more so the development thing. So, so you look at kind of what objective you're trying to meet from a timing perspective and from a market perspective, and then go with one of those options. And sometimes you might even go with multiple options. And Inder said something earlier, which I would bring you back to. He said the two guiding principles are, you know, be in service to the customer's interests and capture markets in transition. That second one, you know, markets in transition is a big part of this timing because when a market's in transition, it doesn't wait. And you either capture it or you, or you don't. It's a one time only. And that drives a lot of the timing as well. Right. Next question. Hi, uh, quick question. Um, so one of the things that makes this work, in my opinion, is uh, the fact that you have the leaders of these functional silos on these boards, yes. that cross-functional boards. And that's a way of getting um, all the leaders and the, uh, the functional leaders focusing on the same problem, i.e. the customer or the uh, markets. Um, how, can you talk a little bit about how do you choose the people on that high-level board and the boards under that, and how, how do the streams work? Right. Uh, I'll, I'll give you two or three little examples. The first one was when we started this, they were appointed, but people didn't think they were important jobs, so you didn't get quality people. Uh, now, John himself, our CEO, picks who is going to run the councils and who each of the members on those councils is going to be. So the council leaders are picked by the CEO. The council members are picked by the council leaders with support of John. And then the leaders of the boards are picked by the council leaders. And what if so I get picked by John too many times? Don't I have? Do I lose well, my Well, that life? actually did happen initially during the last rev of the councils, and then we had to rationalize and say, John, there's only 24 hours in a day. You can't realistically expect people to work more than 19. So I think <laughs> you know we had to actually pare it down and said you can only do two or three at the most. 
councils or boards. What that does is it distributes the workload, but it also gives opportunities to people farther down. And sometimes you find the best ideas coming from the middle and uh, bottom of the pyramid, so to speak. OK, last, last time for one more question. And I, I, right here, please. Yeah. The uh, skeptic in me says that 65% margin pays for a lot of mistakes. <laughs> um, in, in many companies working on lower margins, yeah. they invest in innovation in good times, and then they, then they whack those projects in bad times. Yeah. How have you guys managed good times and it's bad a great times? Great question. Great question. Yeah, the, the, um, it is, uh, while it is true, that 65% gross margin masks a lot of mistakes. It is also true that you have to make very few mistakes to get 65% margin. OK, so I'd, I'd, I'd begin by saying that. Um, what was the second part of your question? You I just, how do you keep this sustained through the bad? I mean, in other words, in flush times, people are happy to fund in oh, okay. but in bad times, they shut it down. So then you have all of these stillbirths, and you never get anything, actually. Right. Some of it, what you do is you have to sort of carve off and ring fence certain kind of funding for certain types of things. And you have to almost protect it and say, we're not going to touch it during good times or bad times. Unless you do that, um, during the bad times, things will get crowded out. So that's been one of our dominant themes is let's really try to carve things off and protect them as much as we can. It's something that has also, you know, instead of going up and down like a yo-yo, we've actually followed that philosophy many times. For example, there's many companies that, you know, have hiring binges and layoff binges and so on. Cisco has generally tried to avoid that. I mean, we didn't lay off uh, hardly anybody during this last downturn and so on. So uh, protecting things and having a culture that focuses not on the near-term quarter, but really five years out, also helps with that. Listen, I w on behalf of the Churchill Club, I want you all to join me in thanking Inder for coming here today. Thank you. The questions were terrific. And let's turn it back over to Karen just to, have, you know, cl to close the, uh, uh, the uh, morning session. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for a stimulating, uh, entertaining discussion. Appreciate it very much. Let's give them one more round of applause, Jeffrey Ender. And thank you, Fenwick, again, for hosting this. Uh, as a symbol of our thank you to the two of you, we have a much coveted Churchill Club t shirt. <laughs> Please wear it in good health. Everyone, courtesy of Books Inc., these, uh, Inder's wonderful book, best-selling book, is available for purchase outside the room this morning if you care to pick one up. And all proceeds? Oh, yes. Uh, we should say that Inder's all proceeds of uh, the book go to charity. All, yes. all proceeds, not just from this event, but just all proceeds ever of the book. Very impressive. So thank you all for coming. And please feel free to follow me on... Uh, at Inders to do on, on, on Twitter. Uh, I try to do a blog every week, sometimes twice a week, so please feel free to do that. <laughs>